Welcome to Esoteric Thoughts. Today we have a very special guest with us, John McHugh. John, how are you? I'm good, Esoteric. Thank you for having me on. No, thank you. John, can you briefly start by telling us about yourself? Yeah, so I'm a permitted Utah archaeologist, and I have a specialty in archaeoastronomy, especially as it relates to the Bible and the Quran. Uh, and also, I have an expertise in uh, Southwestern Native American rock art, and especially how Native American picture writing is really what it is, uh, is connected to uh, uh, calendars. A lot of solar uh, and lunar calendars uh, can be found etched into the, uh, ro the rock writings of the Native Americans, especially in the Southwest. And uh, so uh, I've written the book, The Celestial Code of Scripture, the astral cipher underlying the miracle stories of the Bible and the Quran. It's available on, on Amazon and all the other places you can buy books. This, the subtitle really explains the book. It is the astral cipher underlying the miracle stories of the Bible and the Quran. I was raised devoutly Roman Catholic. Uh, I was taught by kindergarten through 12th grade. I was taught by a nun or a priest every year. And I could never reconcile the hiatuses in natural law that were found in miracles. I also had a hard time looking at the discrepancies in the scriptural texts. So my whole life has been this passionate desire to reconcile my religious teachings growing up and science. And that's what the book's about. And what was it, what was the trigger or triggers that led you on your journey to actually write this book? Uh, what, what led me is that many of the uh, constellations, in Native American thought, the constellations are pictures, literally still frames of scenes from religious history. If you wanted to find out what happened in primordial times, you would look at pictures in the stars to find out, to prove what happened. And it occurred to me that, wait a minute, that's what the Greek and Roman constellations that we have are doing. They're literally, this. they have the same function. They are snapshots or still frames of scenes from religious history. And I thought, well, maybe I could go deeper into that and see if the miracle stories of the Bible and the Quran have a similar origin. And one of the reasons I went to Brigham Young University is it got me to you get to live in this bifurcated world. So I studied Native American archaeology, and most of my field work is in the, in that realm. But it also offered a lot of uh, uh, ancient languages. So I got to learn a handful of ancient languages like Akkadian, which is Babylonian, Assyrian, and Biblical Hebrew, and Nabataean, and uh, Quranic Arabic, and uh, Greek, you know, Koine Greek. And so, uh, yeah, I, I, again, I'm not a linguist. But I play one in podcasts, right? So, so I can do it. If you give me a, a line from the Epic of Gilgamesh or the Old Testament or the New Testament or the Quran, I can translate it. It's just not as pretty and smooth as a, as a linguist, you know? So that's my background. So the bit that I'm really waiting to see, can you actually take us through your presentation on yeah. the book? Yeah, so let me do that. I'm going to share my screen right now. And being because I'm technologically illiterate, this may be difficult, but I will do my best. And I'm sharing it. I'll get it. In, let me get it in. Uh, I just got to get it in slideshow. Here we go. So, do you see the cover of the book? Yes, I can see it. Okay. There it is. It's the celestial code of scripture, the astral cipher underlying the miracle stories of the Bible and the Quran. And I'm writing uh, a sequel to the book. And, you know, that sequel is, uh, it's called Witnessing Jesus's Celestial Seawalk. But a, a, a paragraph in that really summarizes the, the, the study. It's, while a grad student studying the role that astronomical knowledge plays in religious mythology of the ancient civilizations, I stumbled onto an arcane celestial thinking paradigm, unlike any we embrace today. Um, this doctrine held that the constellations depicted still frames of all the monumental incidents that had taken place on Earth. Alternate reading for the cuneiform signs 
um, that were used to spell out the oldest constellation titles in each tableau divulged the details and the action that was taking place in each astral scene. Hence, in the ancient world, the, the constellations depicted an infallible repository of mythical history, which cuneum, cuneiform sources describe as heavenly writing or constellation writing. Religious astrologers, such as the Magi, had followed the star of Bethlehem to baby Jesus, arranged the jumbled array of stellar snapshots and their accom accompanying missives into narratives, which we then recorded, which were then recorded as history in pagan religious mythology, the Bible, and the Quran. And I, I, I know, I in no way mean to sound self-aggrandizing. I'm a mediocre scholar, and I just, I didn't stumble on. I fell over the template of old world religious mythology, and I'm going to present it to you right here. So, um, if you you know, for instance, regarding still frames in the constellations, the Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden stories up there, uh, Noah's flood and ark is depicted as uh, pictures in the constellations. Samson's slaughter of a thousand men with the jawbone of a donkey is up there as a picture in the stars. Jonah's three-day confinement in the sea monster uh, is up there in the stars. Uh, Jesus's virgin birth and sea walk is depicted uh, in a stellar tableau. John's woman-child dragon vision in Revelation 12 can be seen in the constellations. St. Christopher, a giant who carried baby Jesus across the river, is depicted in the constellation. The Islamic claim that, claim that the Quran was based on a celestial tablet in heaven can be found in the stars as a picture. And Muhammad's encounter with the angel Gabriel can also be found as a still frame in the stars. So to, to get there, you got to say, like, well, wait a minute. You know, the constellations you know, they're Greek and they're Roman, you know, how could they even be related to the Bible? Well, to find that, you need to go back to constellation origins. The Greek and Roman constellations that we look at in our night sky originated in Mesopotamia. And as I go in, when I use the term astronomer and astrologer, please know it, it was the same thing in the ancient world. Astronomers were astrologers and vice versa. That didn't, uh, there wasn't a bifurcation in function until about the sixth century AD. So when we think of astrology, we think of prognostication. Everybody loves reading their horoscope, you know, like, oh, what's your sign? You know, what's going to happen to you, right? It's a lot of fun. But it, it overlooks the nuances of what astrology did originally in ancient Mesopotamia, where it originated. So ancient cuneiform tablets refer to the sky as Shittir uh, Shameh, or Shatir Barume, which is, you can translate it as heavenly writing or celestial writing. It's literally the writing of the gods. So the title of an astronomer has nothing to do with astronomy. The title of an astronomer in Mesopotamia is Dukshadu, which means writer. It applies the, implies the ability to read, and what they're reading, a Mesopotamian astrologer's job was to read the encrypted messages in the heavenly writing to discern signs of impending earthly events that could be avoided if they were bad or exploited if they were good. And that's why every king and queen had an entourage of personal astrologers who would inform them as to what the signs in the sky were saying. It was a regal profession. You were one of the most elite scholars on earth if you were an astrologer in the ancient world. And I love that idea. So, Here's the part of astrology that we're not used to. So we're used to astrology predicting the future, right? We're not used to still frames in the constellation or pictures in the constellation uh, verifying historic events. Like we just wouldn't do that today. You'd be considered nuts if you said that today. So the ancients believed that tableaus in the constellations uh, depicted monumental historic events that had once taken place on Earth. And then the second part of that is that wordplay in the constellations cuneiform titles imparted the action and the details that are taking place in each stellar tableau. Again, the pictures in the constellation part, you can get. The wordplay part, I got to explain a little bit. So um, th there actually was a term for it in ancient Mesopotamia. And King Esarhaddon, uh, the seventh century king from Assyria, used he, he brags that he wrote his name in Lamashi writing. And it's, it's constellation writing. He's writing his name in the symbols that replicate constellations. And nobody can figure out 
why he wrote his name in this cryptic script. It's because there was a standing practice. This was the most revered system. If you wanted to understand what the gods were saying to you, you had to utilize this system. So constellation that still frames of religious history. I, I, I'm just gonna show you something. So I don't know if you can still see me. When I do my research in the ancient studies room, I still bring my trowel because I, I wanna think of digging through the linguistics as if I'm looking for celestial artifacts. So I always have it with me and I use the rectilinear ones in case you want to. Um, I very rarely excavate anymore. I'm, I'm always doing, I'm always in an ancient studies room now, but um, anyway, so uh, please think of these, uh, what I'm about to show you as celestial artifacts. So here's a picture from the Farnese Star Atlas. It's second century, right? So you can see like, I'm right in the middle of the screen. You can see Perseus carrying the head of Medusa, right? Well, he's just cut off Medusa's head and then to the left central part of the screen, you see Pegasus. Well, Pegasus hopped from the severed head of Medusa. You're looking at a scene from religious history. Now that's a miracle. Now we today think that's absurd. That didn't really happen. But if you were an ancient Greek or you were an ancient Roman, that proved that it happens. And we just don't think like that. Again, you also see Andromeda, her arms are outstretched. She's tethered to a rock and she's being sacrificed to the, the sea dragon Kedis at the bottom of the screen there. Again, there's another scene from celestial mythology. And by the way, it's Perseus who swoops down and uh, kills this Kedis, the sea dragon, and uh, saves Andromeda. The Greeks actually had a term for this. It's called catastrophism. It means placing among the stars. This is how you became immortal. You had to do some kind of miracle that was so beyond anything anyone could do that it was depicted in the heavens. And that's how you became a deity. So, but there are a bunch of other nuances that we don't think about today that are up there as well. And I wanna just point some out. So Gilgamesh and Enkidu have a, in, in tablet six of the Epic of Gilgamesh, Gilgamesh and Enkidu kill Taurus. They stab it to death. And there's a picture of it from a cylinder scene. The guy on the right is Gilgamesh, the guy on the left is Enkidu. Enkidu's holding the bull by the tail. That human-headed bull in the center uh, is that's being stabbed by Gilgamesh is actually Taurus. So here's what it says, you know, I transliterated the cuneiform there, but it says, and the deity Gilgamesh, like a butcher, breaking the tablet, brave and uh, skilled, uh, uh, pressed his knife in between the nape, the horn, and the slaughter spot. The nape is the the bristle on the neck of the bull, the horn, and the slaughter spot is the jugular. And all the cuneiform scholars are saying, well, look, if you wanted to kill the, the bull of heaven, if you wanted to kill Taurus, why wouldn't you just stab it in the slaughter spot? Why would you stab it near the slaughter spot, possibly in that enabling the bull to survive? So I'll go a little further into that. When you look at Taurus, you are looking at a scene from the Epic of Gilgamesh. So about 10 lines later, we find that Enkidu tears out the Amiti Guana of Taurus and he throws it before Ishtar, who's Venus, right? So Amiti Guana, well, that's the shoulder of the bull. That's exactly how Taurus is depicted. It's cut off at the shoulder. Gilgamesh cut it out and Enkidu tore it off and threw it up in the stars in front of Ishtar. When you are looking at Taurus, you are looking at a celestial artifact that was created during the, the uh, story, the uh, Epic of Gilgamesh. And several times each decade, Ishtar Venus appears exactly as it states in line 155 of tablet six. The bull appears before Ishtar Venus. Now, this stellar bull slaying becomes the emblem of Mithraism, right? It's the bull slaying, right? It's there's Mithras, who's the, the deity embodied in Perseus, stabbing Taurus between the nape of the horns, the nape of the neck, the horns, and the slaughter spot, which is the jugular. He's not stabbing him in the jugular. He's stabbing him exactly where Gilgamesh stabbed him 2,000 years earlier. And it's, it's an, an implacable. It's always the same spot. No matter what image you look, up, you, you look at, Mithras is stabbing Taurus in the same exact spot. Well, that's, a, that's actually on the, on the celestial, uh, on the ecliptic. Um, when you look at Taurus, my, uh, 
when we did our pick, my, my illustrator is a Native American woman. She's wonderful, uh, Elizabeth Hardy. She's real young and she's all really great to work with. But we did our, our artwork over COVID. So we had to do it over the phone. So um, she should have moved the knife a little bit to the left there. But, um, but where Mythic is, Mithras is stabbing the bull is where the vernal equinox point was in ancient Samaria. What Mithras had done, he stabbed the bull and killed it, stabbing it in the vernal equinox point. By killing the bull, it loosed the vernal equinox point uh, resulting in the, the phenomenon of precession of the equinox. That scientific discovery was explained through mythology by stabbing the bull between the, the nape, the horn, and the slaughter spot, Mithras had freed the vernal equinox point, allowing it to drift through the ecliptic in the zodiac at about 26,000 years uh, in, a, in a, a zodiac cycle. And this proved that Mithras was the cosmocrator. He was the, uh, the ruler of the universe. All of the stars conformed to the, the great bull slaying he performed in the third millennium BC. But there are others. So you have like uh, third millennium Mesopotamian seals depict Etana. His name literally means ascender of heaven, uh, ascender of the sky. Uh, he's a shepherd boy and he's carried into heaven by an eagle. Well, that's the prototype for uh, Ganymede, who's carried into heaven by Zeus in the guise of an eagle and becomes the, uh, the water pourer of the gods in the form of Aquarius. But it's also Antonus, uh, who was the uh, pedophilic lover of the Emperor Hadrian and um, who sacrificed himself for the emperor and uh, appeared uh, as an asterism in the stars of Aquila, the, the eagle constellation. And here's its earliest depiction in European star atlases, uh, Aquila carrying, Aquila carrying uh, Antonus into heaven. And you could make the argument that this continental route for Antonus is uh, Etana. And I, I don't go into that. I'll go into that in a future article or book, but not right now. One of the things that's really interesting is the great Sumerologist Ben Alster said this many, many years ago. It was like in the 1970s, he says, as the evidence stands out, the earliest aspects of Mesopotamian literature are exactly these, celestial function and wisdom literature. It's a mistake to assume that astronomic observations could only be uh, conveyed, can be expressed through lists of explicitly stated numbers. Numerous Sumerian hymns and myths take place solely on the starry sphere. What he's saying is astronomical knowledge and wisdom is embedded in the myths. You just have to parse it out. And I feel like I think I did that. So word, here's where it gets hard. I'm just going to apologize to your viewers right now. Wordplay as revelation. We just don't use wordplay that way now. Um, so uh, remember, King Esar hadn't bragged about using the term Lamashi writing, constellation writing. This appears to be a standing practice among the astrologers. And to understand it, you have to understand the solemnity of wordplay in ancient Mesopotamia and the ancient world. Now, we think of wordplay as like a witticism or humor, um, but the, the scholar who uh, discussed this the best is a guy named Scott Noble. He's a, just a world-class uh, Near Eastern scholar. He's at the University of Washington. I, I just have to read this for your readers because it, it's that important. If you don't understand this, you're not going to understand my book. So, so he says, we tend to think of puns as a literary device, a sign of humor, rhetoric. In antiquity, puns were not used in that way because the conception of words was so different. Writing was considered of divine origin. Puns provided diviners with interpretive strategies. And by diviners, he's including astrologers in that. He goes on, because perhaps because written word evolved from pictographs in Mesopotamia, Words were considered the embodiment of the object or idea that represented. While we read the word dog and know that it refers to a dog, ancient Mesopotamian, Mesopotamians would view the word dog as a dog in concentrated form. As a result, individual words contained the power of essence, in this case, the essence of a dog. There was a whole envelope of information that came with every cuneiform sign 
or part of a word. That last line is crucial because it shows up over and over in ancient Mesopotamian astrological texts. So I just want to relate this back to anyone from a Christian background. So remember, in Matthew's gospel, Jesus says to Peter, and I say to you that you are rock, and on this rock I will build my church. Well, that was drummed into my head by second grade by the nuns because the Roman Catholic Church interprets that pun as a revelation recognizing Peter, Petrus, or rock, that's what Peter's name means, uh, as the first pope in the Catholic Church. So cuneiform texts also refer to two other phrases that come together. Uh, they, they use the term amat It literally means hidden words. We would think of it as homonyms, homophones, synonym, synonyms, and a double entendre. The fancy word for it is polysemy, or multiple meanings in a word or phrase. So these amat are the paristu sha'ili, which is the secrets of the gods. If you were an astrologer and you were reading the heavenly writing and you found a pun, a homonym, a homophone, a synonym, or a double entendre, you would experience it as a potential revelation given to you, imparted to you, channeled to you directly from a deity in the stars. And that's why whenever you see a pun, it's accompanied with an admonishment, a chastisement, a secret of the great gods. The uninitiated shall not see it. The, the point being, if the uninitiated had an understanding of these puns, it could be spiritually dangerous. They could use it for ill will to harm the king or the kingdom. And that's why the astrologers were a closed enclave. You had to prove that you were a great astrologer to become an astrologer in the enclaves of the ancient world. So uh, I've been dreading this part. So I'm just going to tell your esoteric thoughts viewers, please bear with me on this. I've got to explain to you how polysemy or multiple meanings in a word or phrase show up in cuneiform. So I got to do this. Strap yourself in. If you got a seatbelt, put it on now because here it comes. So polysemy emerges in cuneiform writing because of a very peculiar process in which cuneiform evolved. Cuneiform is invented by the Sumerians around 3000 BC. They live in Southern Mesopotamia. However, they inhabit Southern Mesopotamia with another ethnicity that speak a different language called Akkadian. It's a, Akkadian is a Semitic language related to Hebrew and Arabic. Um, we later know the Akkadian speakers as the Babylonians and the Assyrians. They eventually accrue political clout in Southern Mesopotamia until the first Akkadian speaker uh, ascends the throne at the city of Akkad. And that ruler's name, you all know him, Sargon of Akkad, right? In about 2334 BC, he becomes the first Semitic speaking king in Southern Mesopotamia. So Akkadian uh, speaking peoples retain Sumerian words through something called Sumerian logographs. So now you just need to know this. Whenever you're reading a text and you see capital letters, that's a Sumerian logogram. It just means, oh, this is a Sumerian word that was borrowed into, um, into the Akkadian language. The only thing that we have similar, I was trying to think of examples. We have one example I can think of. Think of the word pound in English. You know how that symbol LB stands for pound in English? Well, LB is the abbreviation for Libra, which means pound in Latin. And that's a logogram, okay? And that's the only one I can think of. You had so many thousands of logograms in cuneiform writing that that was one of the main endeavors of the scribes. That was their curriculum. They had to learn and memorize these thousands of logograms. So let me just show you how they're using them. Uh, they're using them as a form of exegesis or divine revelation. So. This is the cuneiform sign An. It just means, in Sumerian, it means heaven or skies. It can also be read Dingir, which means God. Um, and An is just, the, it's, it's like an abbreviation. It's like the LB sign pound, right? LB for pound. You can write it really fast. If you had to write out Shamu in Akkadian, you got to use three cuneiform signs. You're holding a clay tablet. You got a stylus. You're trying to imprint it on clay. You're like, dude, let's do this fast. And, you know, boom, it's one shot. Now, 
That's cool. And can be read skies, heavens, or God. Here's where it gets complicated. Oh, by the way, the reason that N uh, in, uh, is uh, connected to the sky, and it's also the word God, is because the earliest, the pictographic form, so in 3000 BC, if you were writing the word for God, you would show the image of the star. This proves that the gods are the stars. That's, this is an example of it in archaic cuneiform writing. So here's where I get, this is the stylized form of N. Remember that star image? Well, this is the stylized form of the on sign. So yeah, it means skies, heavens, and it means God, but it also means a whole bunch of other words. So on is the Sumerian logogram that represents the Akkadian word, yao, which is belonging to me or mine. It can represent kakabu, which means star. It can represent shabultu, which means zero barley. It can mean zukupu, which means to impale. It can mean sha, which means of. It can mean asaku, which means taboo. So when you, so when you inscribe the cuneiform sign on, an astrologer is reading that, and they could say, oh, it also means, it could mean skies, mine, star, barley, ear, impaling of taboo and God in, as a form of polysemy that could convey some kind of a divine revelation. And by the way, these are just part of, there's a whole bunch more. I just didn't want to bar, bore your watchers. So now there's another aspect I got to talk to you about. It's called the homophone system in cuneiform writing. So you'll notice if you're reading, reading tra transliterated cuneiform, you'll see these cuneiform, these syllables with little numbers next to them. And all that is, is here's the mool sign. This is the word for star or constellation. So I'm just going to give you six of them. So if you look at the top of the screen, it just says mool. Then the second cuneiform down, sign down says mool two. Then it says mul three, and then the next one down is mul four, mul five, and then mul x. These are all the ways that you could write the word star or, or constellation in cuneiform. And the problem is it meant many, many, many other words. It represented a whole uh, litany of other words. And that's why it took three years to learn cuneiform. Cuneiform is so Mesopotamian cuneiform is very few people are literate in, in the ancient Mesopotamia, less than 10% of the population, and all of them are working for the king. So uh, when you inscribe the cuneiform sign that's read mul, you could relay the word star, god, shining brightly, inscription, writing, arrow, foundation, ornament, pierce, rib wasp, water course, distant time, fruit, feeling elated, field, cow, moon, and month. And there are just some, there are actually more. That's what a typical English speaker doesn't get when they're looking at cuneiform. There's punning everywhere. And the best place to look for it, what, where they really tip their hand is, the, you know, we all know Genesis, right? The, the creation story in, uh, in uh, the Old Testament. Well, the, uh, the Babylonian and Assyrian Genesis is called Enuma Elish. It means when in the heights or when above. Um, and in tablet seven, there's 163 lines. Let me be clear. Every word of those 163 lines is based on a wordplay embedded in the 50 epithets for the supreme Mesopotamian deity, which is Marduk, uh, which is the planet Jupiter. So I'm just going to give you how they put together line 158. So they knew that Marduk's title was Mul Dingir Nibiru. That's one of his epithets. It's literally, it says star god crossing. His name's, the epithet crossing means it's Jupiter when he's standing on the meridian and crossing the midpoint of the sky. Now, there's something called normalized cuneiform. That's not how it looks on a cuneiform tablet. So when a cuneiform tablet, it looks like this. So you had to, um, each one of those cuneiform signs, mul, dingir, nibiru, look how complicated it is to write the word nibiru in cuneiform. You had to use three cuneiform signs, right? And every one of those cuneiform signs means other words. So mul tu means star, but it also means ushapu, which means they cause to appear. Dingir, as we just saw, that an sign, can mean God, it can mean star, and it can mean skies. The nay to sign isn't used for anything in this pun. B, 
can represent the Akkadian word shu, which means his. And uh, the ru sign can mean uh, which and, uh, and in, uh, in Akkadian. So they just wrote down those puns into co a coherent sentence that gets translated as the god Nibiru is his star, which in the skies they cause to appear. And if you look at line 128 of Enuma Elish Tablet 7, that's it. That's what it comes from. Um, by the way, in Akkadian, there's no verb of being. So when you see is, are, was, the reader inserts that. It's kind of the way you, you is understood in English, like open the window, I'm talking to you. So you might say, well, that's really cool. Well, that's all, but that's just Mesopotamia. How could that be known to people of the Greek world, the Roman world, in the Canaanite world, the Hebrew world, uh, the, the Arabian world? Uh, well, how did that get can, disseminated, right? Well, there's a phenomenon in, ancient, in the ancient world, and I, I love this phenomenon. It's called uh, hostage astrologers or hostage diviners. So the best place to find it is in the book of Daniel. As you, if you're familiar with the Old Testament, Daniel and his three of his countrymen, his Jewish countrymen, are taken hostage by King Babylonian King Nebuchadnezzar II and forced to work in the entourage of the king. And Daniel, is so pronounced in his skills. If you look at chapter five, verse 11, it says that he becomes the supervisor of all the Babylonian occult diviners, including the astrologers. And you're like, whoa, he's a Jew. How did he end up doing that? It's connected to this phenomenon. Now, uh, Assyrian texts, especially uh, during the uh, eighth century BC, the Assyrians, uh, possessed or annexed a lot of the Syrian coast uh, along the Mediterranean. And they were dealing with uh, Greek pirates all the time who were taking hostage, they were taking slaves, they were taking slaves. Um, and so uh, there's complaints about this all the time. So one of the interesting themes, if you look at Lucian, Lucian just says, oh yeah, well, you know, you know, Homer is a Babylonian diviner. He's a Babylonian scholar that was taken hostage by the Greeks, and he taught them how to uh, how to write uh, in Lamashi writing, how to use puns on the stars to create the Greek myths. And if you're not sure uh, if, if Homer was involved in that, you could look at his name, which Homer just means Homeros, just means hostage. It's a guy who was taken hostage. He was probably a Babylonian taken hostage, they said, look, what do you know? And he said, well, there's this whole system of reading the starry sky as a text, and it imparts divine revelation. And that's probably how the Greek myths originated, because they start showing up after Homer appears. Another uh, way that they uh, probably, the hybridization of the Jewish and uh, Babylonian empire during the uh, the Babylonian enslavement in the sixth century. Think of the Magi who come to the, you know, they follow the star of Bethlehem to the, 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 house, the house in which Jesus is born. And then there's the best example is Jesus. You know, if you weren't a Christian, if you weren't a convert to Christianity, you knew that Jesus was a magician and he used miracle, he used uh, magic to uh, to perform his miracles. And there's a picture of him right there on a glass plate from like the third century AD, I think. He's, if you can see, he's holding a magic wand to raise Lazarus from the dead. And so Jesus definitely understood Lamashi writing. And I'll prove that to you a little later in the presentation. But so let's just show how, like, let me just show you how this stuff actually works. So here's a pretty easy one. So um, we all know that in uh, Greco-Roman religious mythology, there's the golden fleece, right? And the golden fleece carried the children, uh, Phrixus and Hele. And uh, during this, uh, this journey, Hele falls off into the sea. So like, how could that be created? Like, how could that be based on a picture in the stars? Well, if you look at, there's a profound tableau in ancient Mesopotamia. It's uh, it's the picture of the hired worker, that's Aries there. Just above Aries is his plow. The hired worker implies he's a field worker. His 
there's his plow, it's the constellation tri triangulum, and there's the field he's assigned to till. So uh, the title of Aries is literally Lu Hunga. Lu just means man, you wouldn't read Lu, you just know it's there. It's, it's a male profession determinative. And then you'd read the Hunga just means hired worker. So this was the foundation of economic success in Mesopotamia, and it was, it was deemed, you know, a divine pursuit if you were a field worker. So remember, cuneiform writing is a, it's a pain in the ass to try to, to inscribe things in cuneiform. So they're always looking for abbreviations and shortcuts. So instead of writing Luhunga, they're just like, well, dude, I'm just going to write the first cuneiform sign, Lu. Now, the problem with Lu is there's about 12 different Lu signs. One of them, Lu number one, uh, remember they're numbered, and if it doesn't have a number, it's Lu number one, is also the cuneiform sign for, you know, ram. So that's, since 1940, historians of astronomy have known that that pun is the basis for Aries, but they just stopped there. They didn't keep going. I'm like, well, look at all the other puns that are embedded in the same exact cuneiform sign. So I'm like, well, Lu can also be read Udu, which means ram. Lu can also be read C, which means becomes. So now you have the hired worker becomes the ram. I'm like, well, that's pretty cool. That's pretty definitive, right? Well, it gets better. So now I'm just like, Again, I said this about a thousand times when I was doing my research, and I don't mean this to sound cocky. I'm a mediocre scholar, but I'm asking different questions. And I'm looking at this, I'm like, could it really be that easy? And I'm looking at it, I'm looking at the Lou sign. And I'll have your viewers look up at that top cuneiform sign there, Lou. Notice it's comprised of two different cuneiform signs. It's a composite sign. One is the Lagab sign, and one is the cuneiform sign called bar. By the way, there's 600 cuneiform signs. Everyone has a name in the same way, like A has the name A and it says uh, B says B, but it's named B. C says K, but it's named C. Well, all 600 cuneiform signs also had names. So the Lu sign is comprised of the cuneiform signs Lagab and Bar. Lagab, one of the words it represents in Akkadian is Sha'au, which means to fly around, flying, right? And the bar sign uh, means horatsu in Akkadian, which means gold. And it's also uh, the cuneiform sign for fleece. So then you write down all the puns. You're like, oh, well, the hired worker becomes the flying gold fleeced ram. I'm like, all right, well, there's your golden fleeced ram. There it is. It's Aries. So keep going. And you're like, and I'm like, I'm looking at this. I'm like, no, because this is going to bore your readers, but I got to do it. So you look at all the other cuneiform signs, all right? And I'm just going to, I put this in the footnotes of the book. I'm not going to do this every single scene. I'm just trying to show you one myth that's based on this. So the mole sign right there, right? It has a bunch of different readings. One of them's knob. Knob is the, the Sumerian word for C. The hun sign in mole hunga, which is the cuneiform sign for um, Aries. It, it, it can be, it, it stands for the verb falls into. Lu can also be read Udu, which means ram. Lu in, has, it's comprised of the cuneiform sign Lagab, as I just showed you, which means flying. Lu is also uh, embodies the cuneiform sign Bar, which means golden fleece. Lu can be read C, which besides meaning because, can also, uh, it means shkuru in, in Akkadian, um, which means curly. And curly is what Phrixus means. Curly, that's his name. His name's Curly. Right. So uh, so that's embedded in that. And Lu is also it, it's also the word man in cuneiform. And it's equated with the synonym Ili, which means carries. And Ili, if you translate it into Greek, you could get Hele pretty easily. The H in Hele isn't a letter. It's a rough reading. It's an aspiration. It's and then you just get Hele and um, the doubling of the consonants pretty common. So when you write down all these puns and you put them out in cohesive statement, you get the flying gold fleece ram carries curly or phrixis, hele. Hele falls into the sea. And that's what it is. That's the dunumant of the myth. And I'm not going to go through every single word in the myth corresponds to Lamashi writing, but I, that'll bore you. And I don't want to go through all that to bore your readers. So let's get to the fun stuff. Let's go. <laughs> I, I'm only kidding when I'm telling, like, I'm going to tell you where the celestial garden of Eden is, and then you can go see it, you know, if you want to. Um, I bet you, when you woke up this morning, I bet you didn't think you were going to do that. Um, and again, I, I, I just, 
it's it's really not that hard once you know Kinefon. So remember that stellar tableau I talked about. Uh, New Year's Day in Mesopotamia, March 21st, early first millennium BC, the Cuneiform star atlas Mulapin says that the hired worker will rise helically. It's going to mark, it marks New Year's Day, March 21st. So, of course, that comes with an entirely intact tableau. That tableau includes Aries, the hired worker, his plow, which is triangulum, the field he's destined to Till, which is the Pegasus Square, and just to the southwest is the water god Ea, Anki and Sumerian, uh, who's Aquarius. It just says it right in the Kineform Star Atlas. It says, I'm not like making this up. You can just read it in full of pain. It says, you know, Ea is Aquarius. You know, so you're like, oh, that was hard. So um, you might say, well, that's cool for Mesopotamian, but what other words are there? Well, when you start going through that, remember Kineform writing a cuneiform socks like that's why everybody went to the alphabet right so they're trying to shorten lahunga so they shorten it to lu well that just means man right well what does adam mean adam in in hebrew just means man so there's your adam so literally the cuneiform title for aries aries is adam then i'm looking, I'm looking at the pegasus square remember that's a field constellation that's team and i'm looking at the cuneiform sign lane it says it says gan. And I'm like, well, that's the Hebrew word for garden. I'm like, okay, that was hard. Um, so then I go down into Aquarius and I'm looking at Ea. And I, you know, I know all of his, you know, they've got uh, deity lists where they list all the epithets for these deities. And one of them is Edim. Edim just means springs. He's a water god, like a, a spring, size of water coming out of, as a freshwater springs. But the alternate reading for that sign is May. And I'm like, no, nah, don't do this to me. And I'm like, May, that's the future tense form of the verb. That means he will be. I'm like, well, that's what Yahweh means. So I'm like, oh, that so and by the way, this guy causes the flood. This is the Babylonian god of the flood, and his name's Yahweh. So I'm like, I'm pretty sure that's how they connected Yahweh and A through uh, synchronically uh, using synchronicity. And it was, what is it? Syncretism. Uh, so so when you write down the pun, then there's more puns. And here's where it gets kind of fun. So, uh, and again, it, it takes a lot of work to do this and it's boring. If you sat with me on a, on a typical day of research, you would fall asleep. You'd be like, this is the most boring thing that I did. And then if I said, well, what did you find today? I was like, well, you know, I was looking at that cuneiform sign that's the garden. Yeah, well, you know what else? Um, ancient texts say that, remember it's, it's celestial, it's constellation writing, it's heavenly writing. In Mesopotamia, if it's constellation replicated a cuneiform sign, that cuneiform sign became the constellation's astroglyph, okay? So um, uh, there's a square cuneiform sign called Lagab. Its sign name is Lagab. And uh, it's the astroglyph for the Gan sign for obvious reasons. It looks just like the Pegasus square. Uh, so remember, the Pegasus Square's title is gone. Its astroglyph is Lagab. And Lagab's got like 16 different readings. One of them is Nin, which means in. One of them is Nigin, which means east. One of them is Bamatu. And I'm like, no, don't do this to me. Bamatu is a synonym for Eden. Eden just means stepland. It means like backcountry. We would call it like backcountry, wilderness. It literally means stepland. And Bamatu is a synonym. So Lagab is equated with Eden. So when you write down the puns, you get a garden in Eden in the east. So that's literally what it says, I think, in Genesis 2, verse 8. Literally, they're translating the cuneiform right into Hebrew. They're bilingual, probably trilingual. Um, and so Aries is Adam, the, the garden in Eden, because in Hebrew, it says garden in Eden, doesn't say of Eden. Um, is the Pegasus Square. Yahweh, as you saw, he will be, is, is Aquarius. And the, the word place has a garden in Eden in the east. And there, there's others. You know, the cuneiform tablet, Mulapin, says that uh, Aquarius is the Shubat, uh, the Shubat or the dwelling of Aquarius. Shubat just means dwelling of. It's a construct form of the Shubatu, which means the residence of or the dwelling of, right? So it tells you that Yahweh dwells in the garden. So, and there was a bunch of other word plays like um, the gun sign, uh, 
that represents the guard in there in the middle of the picture can also, you know, it's also the word for box for obvious reasons. So it looks like a box, right? It has one of its words is Aka, which means to place or to put. So you have Yahweh uh, planted a garden in Eden. Um, by the way, the word plant comes from the, the constellation uh, of the plow, which is Apin. Apin means a ratio. It's a Sumerian logogram for a ratio in Akkadian. And a ratio just means to plant. So, and you can just, I, I'm not going to go through every single word, but the book goes through all of the word plays, and then you find Yahweh put there the man whom he made. Um, fascinating here is the snake. So where does the snake come from? Well, you remember that garden constellation? Remember, it's a square. Its astroglyph is Lagab. Lagab is equated with the word Eden or stepland. Well, <laughs> that's a Sumerian logo. Right? Well, this Akkadian word for stepland is Tseru. Tseru just means stepland. Tseru also means serpent or snake. So literally embedded as a wordplay in the title, in the astroglyph for the garden constellation is the word snake or serpent. And that's probably how the idea of the snake in the garden came, that's probably where it came from. And you can keep going. I'm not going to bust this down and bore your readers, but Yahweh, uh, they actually have the word Elohim up there too, which means gods in Hebrew. By the way, the Hebrew word for God is plural. It's Elohim, gods. Um, and I, I go into why that is in the book, but you, you get the word by Elohim made from Yahweh made from the rib, which he took from the man, made it turn into the woman. Um, you find fruit in the middle of the garden is forbidden. That's all up there in wordplay. Um, you have the words tree of life and tree of knowledge of good and evil. That's up there as wordplay in the puns I just did. Alternate readings for the cuneiform signs I just explained to you, like that Gan sign, the astrolith Lagab. It's all in like two cuneiform signs. You can even find, these are my favorite parts, because the carabim has been a real mystery, and it's just pretty easy to unravel. It's right in uh, Aries. Um, Aries literally has the word carabim uh, in the lexical texts for that, uh, that you, you know, uh, what we would call uh, Aries. Um, you also have a flaming turning sword up there, which is, so when you write down all the wordplay, you get Yahweh placed the cherubim and the flaming turning sword east from the garden. And that's what it says in the Hebrew Bible. So anyway, um, I, I, again, I'm not going to bust out every single one. I'm just trying to give you a snapshot of uh, what the book is about. So uh, I thought we could you could take you guys to the celestial floodwaters. And um, there's actually two arcs. One is the original arc and one is Noah's Ark. And I could just show you if you want to see Noah's Ark, you can show you where that's at. So um, the flood story is fascinating. And the reason it's so amazing is, you know, cuneiform writing is in, it, it's invented in 3000 BC, but the flood story is never even mentioned in Sumerian writing. It doesn't even show up. The first time it ever shows up is in the Sumerian king list dating to like 2050 BC. And it shows up as a two sentence hyperterse statement of fact. That's it. Like the, the flood swept there over. And you're like, well, why did they wait a thousand years to mention it? If this is this, they always talk about the flood being this devastating event that covered the world of the ancient Mesopotamians, well, why did they wait a thousand years before they wrote it down? Because they're not doing that, that that way. The Sumerians never invented a flood story. There's a Sumerian flood story written by Babylonians, but it's written in like 1600 BC. Um, anyway, they're looking, remember, if you are a Babylonian astrologer, you are a writer, you're the author of scriptures and you're looking at the celestial sky as your divine text. The gods are literally channeling the text to you in pictures and puns. So uh, if you look at the picture there, I have the celestial floodwaters there. You'll see a dolphin, a goat fish, you know, Ea, Yahweh is Aquarius, the southern fish, the sea serpent, the river, uh, and it's Argo, which is in Mesopotamia, it's called a magra, but uh, a magra boat's kind of boat. So, these are circumscribed. The celestial sea is a circumscribed region of the sky. It's eight contiguous aquatic constellations. Okay. Now, if you look, there's a crown constellation in the jawbone of the bull. 
yeah, there's a jawbone of a bull up there and you probably know where I'm gonna go with that down the road here with Samson. But so the jawbone of the bull of the asterism is called Hyades and it's written in cuneiform, it's written agu, it just means crown, but that's not all it means. It's a homonym, it means devastating flood. So remember ancient Mesopotamian astrologers are the authors of scripture. And they're reading the celestial sky sometime in about 2050 BC. They're like, whoa, Agu, that's the, our crown constellation. It's our heavenly crown. But wait a minute, it means devastating flood. Hey, a flood once occurred in the ancient world. It once devastated the ancient world. So then there's no, by the way, there's no flood hero, no flood boat, no bird release theme, no, no dunamon, no story whatsoever. 300 years pass before you get the first flood story. That's the tale of Atrahasis, okay? And in that tale, they, they tip their hand. They tell you that the flood boat is a Magor boat. And I'm like, I'm like don't, don't do this to me. Please don't do this to me. So I'm looking at it I'm like, yeah, there's Ma, that means boat. There's Gore, it, it's the Gore 8 sign. Like, by the way, when you're Sumerian, when you're cuneiform scholar, sometimes you just say, it's. It's the Magor sign. Like you look like you're flipping gang signs. Like, no, it's a Magor. Come on, man. So anyway, it's kind of fun. I like doing that. I'm from Southwest Philly. So, I'm, you know, I've seen some gang signs. Anyway, Magor, the Gore 8 sign, it literally means dove, but it's also the word for flood. It's a devastating flood. It's, it's red or Ufai, but it's, it's, that's literally the cuneiform sign for flood. Anyway, so you got flood boat right there. That's the original arc. So, um, so all of a sudden you look at that in the celestial sky and you're like, well, wait a minute, I've got a devastating flood and the Magor boat is floating on this, this, these flood waters, this celestial sky that is now defined as a flood. And that's why the Magor boat is probably the original flood boat. And it's literally the Argo. So when you look at Argo, you're looking at the Babylonian Ark, but there's another one. But before we get to that, so I, I wrote in an article, I think it's in Archaeoastronomy and Ancient Technologies, um, that the Magor boat eventually becomes the Argo. And let me show you why. So like, it's like, so I, I'm, I'm adopted by Irish Catholic families from an orphanage in West Philadelphia. So the only thing they told me is my parents were Polish. So I'm like, so I'm Polish, right? I'm looking at the Magor boat, right? And you know what they say about Polish people, right? So I'm looking at it. So cuneiform literature says that the Magor boat is a ship constellation. I'm like I got that down. They say it's a deity. I got that down. They say it's located in the southern region of the sky. I'm like I got that down. And then it has its prow chopped off. It's whole, the whole front of the boat is cut off in a famous Sumerian myth called Gilgamesh and Aga. I think it's line 98. And you're like, well, wait a minute. Deified ship located in the southern region of the night sky, prow chopped off. I'm Polish, I'm looking for a big ship in the southern region of the night sky that's a deity and it has its bow chopped off. I'm like, well, let's go find that. And you look at the Argo and you say, well, wait a minute, the Argo is a deified ship. It's positioned in the southern region of the night sky and its bow is sever severed from the, the front of the boat as if cut by scissors. So it's very likely that the Magor boat becomes the Argo. And um, by the way, because I love linguistics so much, I, I'm like I'm like this hack linguist. Like I can do it, but I'm not as good as a ling linguist. But I can do it. So um, the Magor boat, it's a stern, right? After the Gilgamesh and Alpa, Aga epic, the bow is cut off. They know it's a stern. The word for stern in Akkadian cuneiform is arku, and if you translate that into Greek, well, that's just it's right off the, that's just right off the shelf. It's the same word, it's argu. The K becomes a G when you shift from Semitic languages to, to, to Greek. So you get argo. And so the word for stern in Arcadian cuneiform is the word for swift in Greek. So you get this bilingual pun. You also get it uh, with, remember that field constellation, the, peg, the Pegasus square? Well, that's iku, right? Well, that's the, that's the Mycenaean word for horse, which is why the, the field constellation turns into a horse. That's just a couple, it's just an extra tidbit thrown in for, for fun. But anyway, uh, so there's proof that the Argo originated from, uh, from Mesopotamia. So, but there's another flood ship 
And in Babylon, you see it in Tablet 11 of the Gilgamesh epic. They specifically state that the prototype for the flood ship is sorry, Ku constellation, it's our field constellation, which is really cool because there's no such thing as a field boat. It doesn't exist. It, 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 this a coup means a square field. It's, a, it's the equivalent is the English word acre. It's a 60 meter square, 60 meters on side. So the Babylonian Ark is literally a 60 meter cube. And you're like, I don't even know if that thing would float, like let alone be the Ark. And how are you gonna put all of the animals on earth in that thing, which they say they do. So again, you're not using scientific logic you're using Lamashi writing, constellation writing. They're reading this in the stars. So and by the way, one of the readings for the uh, Iku sign, the Gon sign, remember the sign name for Iku is Gon. And just like the letter B says B, but it's pronounced, the name is B. So the, one of the ways to read it is, um, is Ma, which is a homonym for the Sumerian word for boat. So, and if you go back into those celestial floodwaters and you look at the arc up at the top of the screen, uh, straddled by Pisces, you'll see the Pegasus Square. That's, that's the Babylonian arc. That's the arc that gets, that's the rectilinear arc that gets embodied in Noah's Ark, as in Noah's Ark. And I'll, I'll show you how that comes about. Um, so, um, I, again, I can show you that the word 300 cubits embedded in that, um, and then what, 300 cubits long, uh, 50 cubits in width, 30 cubits in height. That's all embedded as wordplay, but that's another book that Monkfish wants me to write. So I'm not gonna go into that right now. I'm just gonna show you the etymology. It's unknown etymology. So nobody knows where people, where the Hebrew word teba came from. Now in, in modern Hebrew, it's teba or teva. That's modern Hebrew. Abraham, would have read it as Teba, okay? So there's a T ending, not an H ending at the end in the patriarchal Hebrew. So if you look at your top of the screen there, there's our favorite constellation, it's the Pegasus Square, get used to it because you're gonna keep seeing it. Um, it's a distinct, distinct square in the sky. And if you were writing it in cuneiform, you could write Mul Iku, which means constellation field. Remember, Babylonians, Assyrians, Sumerians, they think of this as a field, okay? The Mul Tu sign, the sign name is Te. And remember, in cuneiform, look at all those wedges you have to use to write Iku. You gotta go click, 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 kick, 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 kick. Pain in the ass. So they're always looking for the shortcut. They want a logogram that's like an abbreviation. So you can also write Mul Tu, Bot, which is just box. You know, the Aku sign is also the cuneiform sign for box, okay? But they're gonna write it in the shortest cuneiform sign possible. One of those is the P sign, which can be read bot. So you put those together and you get te bot, te bot. That's the archaic Hebrew term for Noah's Ark, okay? So it comes right, it, literally it's the constellation box is really what it comes out of. And for obvious reasons, you're looking at the box constellation floating around on the celestial floodwaters. So anyway, um, but that's not my favorite part. This is my favorite part of flooding. Just please humor me on this one. Esoteric thoughts, yours. So in the Quranic flood story, the floodwaters come out of a tanur, which is an oven. And if you don't believe me, you can just read it right there. It says it right in... Um, uh, Surah 11, verses 40 through 44 in the Quran, it says, you know, uh, and when our will was done, the, well, the, the water well, waters welled up from out of the oven. We said to Noah, take into the ark, pair of every species, your tribe, and all the true believers. Literally, the flood waters come out of an oven. I, I've excavated one of these when I was excavating in Syria years ago. That's a tenor. It's a cooking oven. Usually, you use it to cook bread, right? So I'm trying to picture the earth being covered in floodwaters from that, pretty tough to picture, okay? Not if you're reading the celestial sky as a text and you're looking at wordplay as revelation. So remember the Pegasus Square constellation, that's the Babylonian and the Hebrew arc. Well, 
that a coup constellation also means it's the verb for carrying floodwaters. I have all this in the footnotes, if you don't believe me. If you think I'm full of crap and I'm making this up, that's what the footnotes are there for. You can go check my sources. Please do. Uh, by the way, I don't mind being uh, con confronted because uh, I'm very confident about this work. Um, so uh, it's also the cuneiform sign. For, you can, it can be read gatu, which is box. And remember the astroglyph? Remember that lagab sign I told you about? The cuneiform sign lagab, that's the astroglyph for this, this constellation, Pegasus Square. Well, lagab is also read gear, and gear is the word for oven. So wordplay embedded in the art constellation says the oven carries floodwaters. And remember, uh, Muhammad was illiterate. He was tutor tutored by a, a, a magus, a magician named Salman al-Farsi, which is why the Quran is called the recital, because uh, Salman dictated all of these astral myths to him. And then he translated them into Arabic and said them as the autochthonous uh, Arabic scripture. And you, you know that um, because when Muhammad said that he had found all of this, he had been dictated. The angel Gabriel told him all of these Islamic scriptures. He said all of the pagan holdouts that didn't join uh, Islam. They said yeah, this is asatir. It's uh, it's myths of the ancients. He's recycling ancient myths from celestial mythology, and they didn't join him. You know, so uh, that's in. There's ten different places in in the in the Quran where you can you can see that. Um, uh, so I thought while we're going over it, um, if you wanted to know where Samson is, and um, you can see a picture of him uh, killing a thousand men with the donkey's jawbone in the stars. So I'll just take a little sip here. So in Hebrew, you got Shimshun. That's how you write it in archaic Valis Hebrew. It goes right to left. S-H-M-S-H -S -H is the word sun. The W-N at the end, it's the diminutive ending. It's sort of like, in English, it's sort of like the at. Like when you say kitchen at means little kitchen. Well, the un, the W-N ending, literally shimshun means little sun, infant sun, diminutive sun. So you're like, why? Well, let's go look for a, a guy named little sun, right? So going back to that crown constellation in the jawbone of the bull, you already know where I'm going with this. So there is about 12 different ways to write that constellation title. One is with the Sumerian logogram main, which just means crown, but it also means a whole bunch of other words in Akkadian, as I showed you earlier. One of the words is agu, which is crown, but main also represents the word shamash in Akkadian, which means sun. It also represents the word shabu, which is king, and it's also the word for baby or infant. So embedded in this as double entendre in this cuneiform sign for hi the Hyades is the word uh, infant son or baby son, little son, Samson. That's what Samson is. He's a little son. And that's why his name's so peculiar. But there's more to it. Remember, you know, the Hyades asterism is, is uh, held within the Taurus the bull. And Taurus, it goes by the cuneiform sign gu, gu for, it's the gu for sign, it's gu for. Um, so gu for mean, can mean bull, but it also means warrior in name. So you get the words, a warrior named infant son, warrior named Samson. So um, this is where it gets fun. And I, I just, again, I kept saying like, no, it can't be this easy. So I'm looking at the cuneiform titles for the bull and I'm like, there's the P-rig sign. That's one of the titles for Taurus. I'm like, I already know that the Purig sign is read gear three, which means donkey. So the jawbone of the bull is also the jawbone of the donkey. And I'm like, I can't, it just can't be this easy. Like, I'm, I don't mean to sound cocky. I'm like, I, I just, I'm like, oh my God. And then I'm looking at the Sumerian term for jawbone. It says EC. And if you look at the lower left there, I'm like, oh my God. I know what an Akkadian scholar could read that at. Is the, it's called the construct form. It's the possessive form of the word isu, which means jawbone. Is C, if you look on the right side of your screen, means jawbone of the, an Akkadian, and then C would be the logogram for donkey. So jawbone of the donkey. So there's two or three ways where you get jawbone of the donkey 
out of the Hyades asterism in Taurus. And there's your donkey's jawbone. So, you know, so you have um, the Hyades asterism represents Samson. Uh, the jawbone of the donkey is also embodied as another wordplay on the Hyades asterism in, in Taurus. The title for bull, which is Lu, is a homophone for Lu, which means to seize or to grab. So you get the word Samson grabs the jawbone of the donkey. And then, and then it's just, you know, these eye star of the bull. Aldebaran is the brightest star in the bull. It's the bull's eye, literally. And it's called Igi in Sumerian. Igi just means eye. It's also the cuneiform sign for 100. And Igi can be read Gi, and Gi means to kill in Sumerian. So, um, and I just told you that Taurus can be read Lu, which means bull in Akkadian, but it's a homophone with Lu, which means man. So you end up with wordplay in the celestial writing gives you Samson kills a thousand men. So um, that's probably how they came to the idea that Samson did this, this absolutely impossible feat. He killed a thousand warriors, a thousand men with the jawbone of a donkey. So wanted to know how Jonah was followed by Kedis, the sea serpent, the sea serpent constellation. I'm sorry, I've been talking a lot. So again, another one of my favorite myths. So when you look in the Hebrew Bible, it specifically says that Jonah was swallowed by a dagavol, a giant fish. Okay, there's a picture of it. One of the like 16th century painters does it. However, in the Greek Old Testament, in uh, Jesus being quoted in the Gospels and in early Christian iconography, uh, Jonah is unequivocally swallowed by a ketos, which is a sea dragon, literally. It's a dog-headed sea serpent. I assure you, if you look at those bottom pictures, there is no fisherman that has ever caught that animal, okay? The only place you're going to find that animal is in the form of Ketis, the dog-headed sea dragon, which is in the constellations, right? So how did, how did, uh, let me just tell you where Joan is first. Remember that Magor constellation? Well, Magor, there's about eight different or 10 different cuneiform signs that are written Ma. The Ma 2 sign means, it, it means boat. The Ma 1 sign is the word for prophet. So it's a homonym. So when you wrote Ma Gore, you know that it, mo it meant boat. Gore 8, with this, the cuneiform sign you see there, is literally the cuneiform sign for dove. Jonah means dove. So Ma, which means boat, is also a homophone with ma number one, which means prophet. So you literally have the words, the prophet Jonah. So uh, embedded in the Argo is probably, they're probably looking at the Argo, the original flood boat, as also the words, the prophet Jonah. So, so how did the prophet Jonah come to be swallowed by a big fish in the Old Testament and a dog-headed sea serpent, Kedis, in, in the New Testament? And in Christian iconography. Again, it's based on wordplay. What really fascinates me here is you're getting into the mind of Jesus. Jesus knew that the biblical text said dagdol. He knew it said big fish. However, he tells us that he's followed by a ketos, a dog-headed sea serpent. I'm like, oh, it's right there. So to, to reconcile the two, you again turn to Enuma Elish, the Babylonian creation myth, Enuma Elish, Tablet 7. Um, actually, several of the tablets, including Tablet 7. Um, if you remember in Enumulish, Tiamat is the, the sea goddess, the ocean goddess. She's killed by the planet god Marduk, which is Jupiter, and she's put up in the stars. She becomes the wet region of the night sky, right? So because she had three um, babies, she had three dragon babies, they appear in her own night sky. There's Ketis, the sea dragon, there's Hydra, the water snake, and there's Draco, the dragon that winds itself around Polaris, the pole star. So um, when they're referred to in the aggregate in Enuma Elish Tablet 7, they refer to them as Mushmak, which means, it literally means, Mush just means serpent or dragon, and Mak just means big, gigantic, huge. So you have a huge serpent. However, you if you were um, 
an astrologer and you knew Lamashi writing, you would have read the lexicons that said that mush is also a kind of fish. It's probably an eel. Um, and so it refers to a big fish. And some of the lexicons actually say that. So it tells you what Jesus knew. Jesus probably knew Lamashi writing. He was probably indoctrinated, maybe when he was in Egypt, into uh, occult scholarship. And he knew that the words big fish were embedded in the Old Testament story of Jonah, and that he knew that that same constellation could also render, uh, you know, Mushmak, the giant serpent, which is the sea serpent Kedis. And if you don't believe me that Jesus knew this, I just turn you again to everyone who wasn't Christian. They're like, well, how did Jesus perform his miracles? Well, he's a magician. There's a picture of him there raising Lazarus from the dead using a magic wand. And every Jew and every pagan saw Jesus as a magician. They're like, oh, yeah, well, he knows magic. Well, and he's a really good magician. He's actually good enough to start his own religion. Um, so uh, I thought now we could maybe jump into, uh, if you wanted to know what the Star of Bethlehem was, and uh, you can actually find this stellar picture upon which Jesus' nativity is based on. And that's kind of a fun one to look at. I was hoping your readers would enjoy that. Um, so, um, so Jesus is a baby, right? We have two different, two different, absolutely, entirely unreconcilable versions of Jesus' birth. Matthew tells us that Jesus is, that, that a prodigious star appears that, astrologers from Babylonia follow it uh, to Jerusalem, and then the star hangs a left and goes another six miles south, south and literally stops over the house of the Christ child. And you're like, whoa, over the house of the Christ child? Ain't no star is going to be doing that. There's no way, brother. That ain't happening. So I'm like, I, okay. And then you read Luke's, for, I mean, I remember reading this with the nuns. I'm like, whoa, they made us read both stories back to back. I'm like, Sister Regina, Luke just told me that Jesus was born in the caravanserai, which is the courtyard where all the, car where all the uh, animals are kept. There's no rooms in the surrounding inn. She's out there and she has to use this makeshift uh, crib. She has to use a feeding trough as a makeshift crib. So I'm like, and how could Jesus be born in a house with magi present and no magi present and Jesus born in a manger, uh, you know, and swaddled in cloths? Why is that such a big deal? So I can show you what that's all about. So when you look at Regulus, which is the brightest star in Leo, the title of Regulus, it's the king star. It's written Sharu, but Sharu is literally a homonym for a child or baby or infant in the same way that you could say like a, a bear in the woods and to bear a child. It's a homonym like that. The, the cuneiform sign is equated with the Sumerian logogram may, which means anointed one. It means pashishu in Akkadian, which means anointed one, right? So the anointed ones is Christos, it's Christ. So, so wordplay embedded in the titles, all of the titles for a regulus render the Christ, Christ child, the king. That's exactly how he's described in uh, uh, Matthew's birth story and Luke's birth story. And by the way, M Mark and John don't even write down a birth story. So then you're like, well, where's this pregnant virgin at? You know, wouldn't it be cool if we found a pregnant virgin in the stars? I'm like, yeah, it would be really cool. I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to take you to her right now. So I'm looking at Virgo, she's a Parthenus in Greek. It's the same word used to describe, to describe Mary. She's a virgin, right? But in Mesopotamia, her north western stars, she has an asterism embedded in her. It's the pregnancy goddess, Eru is her name. And Eru is pretty definitive. The word literally means to be pregnant. So you have Virgo, who's a, a title, an asterism in the, that constellation of Virgo reads to be pregnant. So you have a pregnant virgin just east of this Christ child baby, uh, which is the star Regulus. And if you really want to go further, the cuneiform title for Virgo is obscene. And if, if uh, Mesopotamian astrologers wanted, remember, they're always trying to abbreviate. And they're like, instead of writing obscene, I'm just going to write ah. 
Well, Ab is the cuneiform sign that represents Muratu. Muratu is another homonym. It literally means bitter and it literally means sea. So remember what Mary's name is. Mariam, the Greek Mariam, is from the Hebrew Mariam, bitter sea. Bitter sea just means salt water. You can't drink it. That's why they call it bitter sea. So Mariam's name, it's a peculiar name, but it's right there in the word place. So you have a pregnant virgin named Mary. So I'm like, I, I'm going to go out on a limb here. I'm going to think that I bet that's identified as Mary in the Gospels. Remember, the, Matthew and Luke had no clue how Jesus was born. They had no idea. There were no eyewitness testimony to, to Jesus's birth. Everyone who saw Jesus's birth was dead. And if they were relying on the birth testimony of, uh, of Joseph and Mary, they're so incongruous. The only way you could reconcile it was that Mary and Joseph had senile dementia. Um, and I don't think people want to do that. But if you've got the system for proving archaic events, you just look up in the stars and it's right there. So I'm going to, so by the way, and I go into it in the book. Um, so there's a, a gazillion alternate readings for the cuneiform signs. And I'm just going to tell you, I'm not going to bore your audience with it, but the Greek text in Matthew tells you what the star gives. Here's what it does. It goes, the star went before them until having come, it stood over where the child was. And then the next line, they use the term oikos, which means it's like accusative term for house in Greek, right? So, so it's right there. Like it's all written in puns. Every one of those words correlates to a, a constellation writing pun embedded in the titles for the child star Regulus. And that's how you got even the words, there's even the words three astrologers, believe it or not. So, um, but I go into that in the book. I'm not gonna really go into it now. I'm just trying to show you there's a picture of it in the stars. So Luke's version, we are like, well, Luke doesn't say that. Well, the reason Luke doesn't say that is he's got the same picture story, but he includes the manger asterism in Cancer. So M44, the star cluster in Cancer is called Thotene, just means manger. And it comes from the idea, remember, it's in cancer, right? It's a crab, right? Well, very large crab shells in Mesopotamia were filled with fodder and used as a manger, which is where the idea probably comes from. But anyway, so if you look at all the titles for Regulus um, and, uh, and Leo and M44, you end up with, uh, and I'm just going to go through them, you get the words, you know, a star, the Multu sign is also the logogram for emedu, which means to lie or lying, like lying down. And sheru means infant, we've already gone over that. The Sumerian logogram for Regulus is lugao, which means king, but it also means fine cloth. The titles for Leo are ah, which means lion, and it also is the Sumerian logogram for ina in Akkadian, which means in. Um, another title for Leo is labu, which means lion. It's also the verb to wrap up. And M44 is a manger. So, you know, so Luke's looking up there. He's looking at the picture story of Jesus's birth. And the word plays reveal a whole, all the details from that picture story. And they tell him an infant wrapped in cloth lying in a manger. And that becomes, what is it? Luke chapter two, verse 11. Remember the sign? Um, it's the sign of the infant that he's going to be wrapped in cloth. He's going to be swaddled and lying in a manger. And that's where it comes from. That's why I picked those words to show your audience. So, um, so most people don't realize that, you know, you, you know, Jesus rises from the dead. Of course, that's his signature miracle. He, he he's resurrects from the dead. But his, his second most popular miracle is walking on water. And we use it all the time as a euphemism for uh, miraculous, you know, impossible, supernatural, right? Like, you want that done by when? You think I can walk on water? You know, we say terms like that. Um, so it's come into the common vernacular. And, uh, you know, uh, but I was fascinated by this because I, I just remember I'm taught by nuns and I had so many remarkable conversations with Sister Regina, Sister Pat Hagen, and all the other nuns that taught me in grade school. And it was Sister Imelda. She hit me a lot though. But um, anyway, um, so most people don't realize that, you know, 
Orion walks on water, according to His Hesiod, he walks on water in 700 BC. It's, it's written in a text called the astronomy. So I think it's based on something astronomical. And when you look at Orion's position in the night sky, he's literally, literally taking his first step out on the celestial waters that are uh, the celestial sea that's uh, de demarcated by the eight contiguous aquatic constellations. His front foot, I think it's the star Rigel, they call it Rigel, which it just means like foot in Arabic or leg in Arabic. Um, it's also one of, it's, it's, uh, it's the same star, like the first or second star in Eridanus, the river constellation, which is interesting. It's right in the Greek star atlases. And I'm like, I can't believe anyone else has figured this out. It's just right there. Um, so um, anyway, again, I'm not a great scholar, but I'm asking very different questions. I, I'm saying, no scholar would say, well, you can't prove Jesus walked on water. You can't prove Orion walked on water. And I'd say, I'm going to see if you actually can prove that Orion and Jesus walked on water. That's the difference. I'm not, I'm just looking for the evidence, even though everybody's already told me you can't find it. So, so you might say, well, how could the the evangelists of the New Testament come to the idea that Orion was Jesus. How could they do that? How is that possible? Well, in cuneiform writing, Orion's got like 15 different titles. He's often defined as a shepherd. He's also defined as a son. And one of his uh, Kineof Sumerian cuneiform titles, you look up at the upper left there, is Dingir Damu. Another one of his Sumerian titles is Mu Sukha. Now, please look down at the lower left part of the screen. So when you say Dingir Damu, you just mean the sun deity as an S-O-N deity, the sun deity. And Dingir just means God, but it also means of. Sukal, it means messenger, but it's also the Sumerian logogram for the Akkadian word Pashishu, which means anointed one. So you all of a sudden, have these words embedded in Orion as celestial word plays. You have son of God and anointed one. And remember, anointed one is Christ. It's the supreme epithet for Jesus. Jesus was the Christ. That's what made him so special. So they're looking at this picture. I'm like, oh, well, there's the Christ. Well, then we know Jesus walked on water. So I go into showing how all the discrepancies in the, in the Matthew Mark and John's version of, of the sea walk are different in the gospels and celestial word play, Lamashi writing word plays explain that. I'm not gonna go into it here. I am gonna show you that um, the words tread upon the sea are also up there in case you don't, it's not just a picture. Um, so when they're writing this down, uh, remember the constellation, I'm look at, looking at Mu Sukho up there in the upper left. Remember, Mu just means star or constellation, but it also can be read Shuhub, and Shuhub is a Sumerian verb that means to step upon or to tread upon. And so, you know, what you get is the Son of God, Christ, the you know, anointed one, is treading upon the sea. Uh, by the word, Mu can also be read Nab, and Nab is just the cuneiform term for sea in Sumerian. So, um, one thing that's really interesting, I'm just going to leave you as far as this story goes. Um, if you remember, in all of Jesus's sea walks in the Gospels, he steps down from a mountain and positioned just behind Jesus is Gemini. Gemini is a twins in Mesopotamia, but it's a twin mountain constellation called Mashu. Mashu just means twins. Um, in fact, Gilgamesh climbs this mountain in the Gilgamesh epic, and that's what gets him on the, uh, the ecliptic. And he's, he races with the sun on the ecliptic, which is a whole nother story, which is fascinating, which sort of suggests that uh, the Sumerians knew about procession of the equinoxes almost 2,000 years before Hipparchus and the Greeks. But uh, that's another story. Um, anyway, uh, so I'm going to get into the last segment of this presentation, and it's the Quran. Um, uh, two different passages in the the Quran claim that it is a celestial tablet preserved in heaven or in the sky. Okay. And um, so you see this celestial wisdom uh, encoded in the Quran, in, Quran, in some of the Quranic titles. Um, I, I spent three field season excavating in the Middle East, uh, in Syria and Jordan. So I, 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 I can, I still have reading knowledge of Quranic Arabic. I, I can communicate in Arabic, but I'm not 
a fluent speaker by any means, but I, but I can read Arabic and stuff. And um, so it's interesting when you look at Surah or chapter 53, it says al najum which means the star. Um, chapter 54 is Al-Qamar, the moon. Uh, chapter 85 is Al-Baruj, which is the zodiac. Uh, chapter 91 is Al-Shams, the sun. And you think of like the, the, uh, the um, pen Pentateuch, the uh, first five books of the Bible. I mean, imagine if they were named like the star, the moon, the zodiac, the sun. You'd kind of think that, wow, maybe, maybe this is celestial information. The, the Quran tips its hand. And it's because Muhammad is being tutored by a Persian magician. He, this Persian magician knows all of the celestial myths. He's multilingual. He's fluent in Judaism. He's fluent in Christianity. And he just got bought by Muhammad. He was a slave, which is another common theme when you think of hostage astrologers. He dictates these myths to Muhammad. In fact, he spends so much time with them that Muhammad's wives start, in the Hadith, they start complaining. Like, he spends all his time with uh, Salman, the Persian. He doesn't spend any time with us anymore. And, and then some of the complaints from the, um, the pagan Arab holdouts are that he's being dictated a satir, which is myths of the ancients. And then he's just translating the myths he's hearing into Arabic, and he's redispensing it as, as uh, indigenous uh, Islamic uh, revelation, what we call the, the Quran. So, um, which means, by the way, Al Quran, the recital, the recitation, that's what it means. So, um, in pagan, uh, this is, I, I had two field seasons in Petra, Jordan. So, um, uh, in, in, this is from the Temple of the Winged Lions. This is a picture of the Nabataean goddess. But, so, in, you have these things called betels uh, in, in uh, pagan uh, Arabia. And what you have is they look like uh, uh, picture frames but they're carved into the rock. And then you would put the image of the, your deity and pray to that deity, or you might have multiple deities, and you would pray to that deity. And it's a very astral-based religion. Um, and there, there's some evidence that one of the titles for the moon god is, um, uh, Al, is the god, Allah, the god, which, you know, that's what uh, Muhammad said. And that's part of the reason why the pagan holdouts could believe him, because a lot of what he was recycling was pagan Arab uh, revelation, I should say scripture. But anyway, getting back to celestial mythology, so the, the, all of the Hadiths, every Muslim scholar will tell you that the Quran is based on a celestial tablet that's kept in the sky, it's kept up in heaven. And it's back, that's where Allah is. So remember that Pegasus Square constellation that we've talked about quite a frequently, quite a few times so far today. Um, well, that cuneiform sign, remember the astroglyph is Lagab. Well, Lagab is also the cuneiform sign for writing tablet. And if you were going to write that as a constellation, you would just write Mul Lagab, which renders celestial tablet. Okay. Now, Lagab can also be, uh, the cuneiform signs for this constellation can also be read A, or E is, which means to name and rejoicing, uh, re excuse me, reciting. So you have a celestial tablet. Um, when you write down the puns, you get a celestial tablet named the reciting or the recitation, the recital. You have a celestial tablet named al Quran, the recital. Okay, and then other lexical commentaries that were studied by the astrologers renders the Pegasus square as it, it literally in the lexical text it says, "Ooh, the Sumerian term, ooh ilu." It, that literally says, "The Pegasus square is the god," and of course, the god is what Allah means. It means the god. So I'm wondering if the idea of these square baked owls. They're literally these things that are cut into the rock or literally called that. It literally means house of the God. I'm wondering if uh, this comes from this idea of celestial mythology that this square constellation is the God and they're looking at it in the stars and they're replicating it in, on earth very much like the Our Father prayer. 
on earth as it is in heaven. They're bringing down the heavens onto the onto the earth. So anyway, um, that's how uh, I was going to kind of conclude it. The book is called The Celestial Code of Scripture, the Astral Cipher Underlying the Miracle Stories of the Bible and Quran. Um, my name is John McHugh. Uh, I'm going to go out. Of, I'm going to stop sharing there. And um, I hope I wasn't too pedantic or boring for the esoteric thought viewers, but I would get very excited. And I just hope that I could share that passion with you and uh, you enjoyed the presentation. So thank you so much for viewing that. John, I really, really, really enjoyed that. Uh, I personally have read the book and I found that the footnotes were very key in terms of verifying what you had in the actual text. So for anybody who reads the book, I do encourage them to take the time to go through the footnotes. One of the questions I have, John, is I'm more familiar with the uh, mythology and the celestial origins from an Egyptian point of view, but I can see the direct correlations in the stories. So how did these myths and the celestial origins, uh, how were they able to be trans transmitted between different civilizations right the way down into the biblical texts? Yeah, it was that process called um, hostage, uh, hostage diviners or hostage astrologers. They're all, when the first thing you would do if you were a vanquishing king and you took in and you conquered another city, the first thing you would do is you would round up every uh, exorcist, every lamentation priest, every diviner, every uh, person that reads uh, liver omens and every astrologer. And you would bring them, you would wine them and dine them and you'd bring them into your, they would be welcomed in your entourage, which is exactly what Nebuchadnezzar II does with Daniel and the three, his three Jewish countrymen. Um, you also, I didn't go into it much here. I do go into it in the book. The Assyrians were having a, they were having a hell of a time with the Greek pirates coming in and invading coastal Syria, which was under Assyrian control. And they were, taking people as slaves, and they were taking them off and bringing them back to the Greek homeland. Um, you know, it coveted, the, the goal of it is to hold somebody who's valuable for ransom and get ransom money for them. And in fact, Dionysius is held, in his, he, he's taken by slave traders um, and held for ransom in that very similar scenario. But they probably came across this one guy, uh, you know, we call him Homer, and they said, "Hey, you know who are you? I'm a I'm a Babylonian astrologer. I my specialty is I know the myths of the I know how to read the celestial writing." And they say, "Could you teach us that?" He may have well had been one of the people that brought the Phoenician alphabet because I'm assuming Homer also knew Phoenician, so he probably knew a cuneiform. He knew Phoenician. There's a guy named Walter Burker, who I almost had a chance to he. He's friends with the scholar that taught me Akkadian. And uh, he writes about this uh, numerously uh, with the uh, exchange of ideas. But that's what the alphabet is. Like it's based on uh, cuneiform, right? Like, like alphabet, like it, there's no word alpha and there's no word bet in Greek. It's the aleph date. It's aleph in Hebrew and Canaanite is, is, and Phoenician, it means, it means bull and bait means house, it's the bull house. It literally tells you how you got to memorize these cuneiform signs because they're coming from pictographs. Um, so it shows you the system of learning. But again, Homer, his name means hostage. I'm like, I'm like and Lucian literally tells you, oh, he has this mock interview. Remember, Lucian's a satirist. He, he's always got his tongue in his cheek, but, but it was common knowledge amongst the scholars that Homer was, he was a hostage. He was probably a Babylonian that was taken hostage by the Greeks. And he said, look, there's a whole new pantheon up there. Let me help you read this starry sky. He probably taught a cadre of scholars cuneiform, and you probably had this, uh, this bilingual cadre. When I say bilingual, I mean Greek cuneiform uh, cadre of scholars who were, Invent, I don't want to say inventing because that's not true. 
getting getting celestial myths channeled to them from the star gods, which they were then writing down as indigenous Greek uh, religious mythology. I hate the word mythology because it implies something that's not true. Um, I, 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 if you were a Greek, you believed it 100% in the same way that a Christian believes Jesus resurrected from the dead, and that a, that is the Muslims believe that Jesus is the prophet of Muhammad. And I can respect all those traditions, and even the, the pagan ones. Um, and I, I, you know, in emails we've joked, and I said like, one of the things is if you're if you're Catholic, you're pagan, you just don't know it. <laughs> you know? So I hope I can connect Catholics to their pagan roots in this book, you know. And the name Homer, um, increasingly seeing his name being mentioned. So I had a conversation with Dennis, Dr. Dennis MacDonald, who writes about the Homeric epics and how those stories were uh, translated into the gospels. So I know you don't like using the word myths, but for want of a better word, looking at those Greek myths that Homer wrote uh, and how they were literally in the Bible, in the gospels, as you've gone through your presentation, I can actually see the correlations between the, the Mesopotamian into the Greek, into the gospel. So you're actually helping to join the dots here. And the question for you, in terms of the criticisms that you that your work has got, can you talk us through some of the criticisms? Yeah, the, well, one of my close, uh, you know, my research partner is a guy named uh, John Lundvall. Um, and we do a lot of Native American archaeoastronomy studies out here. Um, but, you know, the, the criticism is, I, uh, it, it ends up not being testable. Um, you, they don't say, hey, guess what? I'm using this pun to explain, you know, this myth uh, as the basis for this myth. They never say that. You just infer it. And what I try to do is present so much data from pagan scriptures, then from uh, Old Testament scriptures, then from uh, Christian scriptures, and then from the Quran to say, wait a minute, there's, there's a common thread here. Because they just... It, Punning is the most revered system of revelation in the ancient world, and uh, they don't reveal that stuff. They keep it secret, um, and that's the dilemma. So the, the weakness is simply, is it testable? It's not really testable. I try to just give you so much data that you're like, wait a minute, there's just too much here for it to be a coincidence. That's what I'm trying to get get you to. And, and by the way, uh, Esoteric, I want to mention one thing. So just say, I realize I'm in a new field of scholarship. It's, it's really constellation writing scholarship. But um, let's just say only 70% of what I wrote is accurate and 30% is inaccurate. That means in a new discipline of scholarship, I just found 70%. And I can I mean that's pretty good. Like, or even let's go lower. Let's go with 60%. The starting point is 0%. Everybody just knows, well, well there's a flood story amongst the Babylonians. Wait, you, you, the Jews have a flood story. Wait, the, the, the Romans have a flood story and the Greeks have a flood story. Well, how, I'm trying to connect all those dots using the Lamashi writing, constellation writing. I, I love the idea of the Our Father prayer on earth. It is in as it is in heaven, you're bringing the heavens down to earth. And I believe that that's what I'm trying to do in the book. So their scriptures, the Jews, Christians, and Muslims that have shied away from their religious teachings realize that, that it's very vibrant, but it's based on a different kind of thinking. It's based on the idea that pictures and wordplay in the stars frame inviolable truth, truth you can't even question. It's so inviolable that even if it contradicts natural law, you will, will not ignore it. You'll write it down as fact. And that's where I was trying to go with that. And the book is currently available on Amazon? Amazon.com. You can get it in anywhere where books are sold. And uh, 
I just want to, I hope I wasn't too pedantic there, but I get a little excited and uh, I just, I just thank you for your patience. I want to thank your uh, viewers for their patience and uh, going through all that with me. It's a, it's a lot of data to, to have uh, strewn on you uh, in one presentation, but I hope the pictures helped. And I want to thank my, my illustrator, Elizabeth Hardy, who's a delight to work with. She's a, she's a real treat. Um, so thank you so much for having me on Esoteric. It's been an honor. Well, thank you, John. Uh, we definitely have to have you back. I can, I've already planned a few more episodes for you for the futures, for the future. So uh, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Esoteric.